me unmuted there. Yes, there we go. Appreciate it. Uh, so it is Father's Day. In honor of my father, I wore my cool kicks that I wore last week as well. Uh, the dad shoes, as some of the pastors in town so affectionately refer to them as. And uh, I wanted to start by wishing you all a happy Father's Day this morning. I know, dads, that this morning each and every one of your families were up on time. They were engaged, your kids were engaged this morning, completely and utterly obedient. They were loving towards you and your spouse. They allowed your blood pressure to stay steady. All of that happened this morning on this special day, am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, interesting. You know that sometimes things happen that we don't expect in that vein in this world. And I think that's why Jesus says things like John 16, right? Like I have overcome the world. But... Today is a particularly special day because on this day above all days, I feel like everybody in the world gives dads a pass on their terribly dry humor. Like, seriously, this is an opportunity for us to prime the transmission to shift upward like an 18-wheeler from the jokes all the way from the time we wake up to the time that we get to go. And your kids should laugh at them. I mean, if you look at, uh, I got a little, a little comic up here that I want to share with you this morning. I thought it was pretty good. Am I on, guys? You want to get me on the PowerPoint there? Should advance. There we go. So you can take a look at that and, and read that. Some good dad humor to get us started this morning. I thought it was pretty good. And I, and I want to follow up as well. We are about to, towards the end of service today, embark on a voyage on the warship. See what I, see what I did there? Worship. Um, so we can keep the boat humor going just a little bit longer this morning. Um, but in all seriousness... All right, in all seriousness, I realize none of that was actually that funny, and that's okay, that was kind of the point, right, because that's, that's what dads do, all right? In all seriousness, no, God takes seriously the role of a father. He takes seriously fatherhood. He created the job description. He interacts with us as father. Our theme verse at Alliance Youth is based in that truth. The father loves his son and has placed everything into his hands. God's will is to be the father who loves the son and shares that love with the spirit. We know the stats about fatherhood. Kids are more likely to abuse drugs, to have depression, to commit suicide, to drop out of school, struggle with anxiety, all because of fatherlessness. Fatherhood matters, and biblical fatherhood paints for the world a picture of how our heavenly father desires to interact with each and every one of us, and it serves as a reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fatherhood done well is rooted in faithfulness to Jesus, and it points others to God. And we're going to be talking a lot about faithfulness today as we dive into God's word. So dads, tune in. Everybody tune in. This is a message for all of us, and my hope is that we will lead ourselves better and we will lead our families better after our time in the Word this morning. So thank you for being here today. Let's dad on. See what I, see what I did there? That was, yeah, I'm done with the, I'm done with the dry humor. You guys want to cue up that, uh, that Youth House video? We're going to show the same one we showed last week here uh, one more time this summer. Checking out the youth house back at the end of the vid. Uh, yeah. The youth house? This is awful. Reckon? Pastor Chris! Dude, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be in school? Are, are you videoing me right now? Yeah, I'm gonna be a YouTuber for Jesus. Oh. But well, I don't know what Jesus would think about this. This? This is what we call progress, man. Uh. <laughs> I don't think progress smells like this, Pastor Chris. You might be right about that, Brecken. But if I can be real with you here for a minute, we've had a huge influx of Alliance Youth students over the past couple of years, and you have another huge incoming fifth grade class in the fall of 2022, and we don't fit in the basements anymore without adding your class in. So when your class comes in, we're really gonna struggle to fit with numbers here over at the youth house downstairs. So something needs to change, and that change right now has been to move things upstairs. And we've gotta do something to make this space more inviting and more accessible um, with those changes. Come here and take a look at this here. 
You see these stairs? These stairs are a major problem. They're treacherous. Navigating these on crutches, um, falls that happen on the stairs, uh, all of those different things. I mean, if, if we want to invite grandparents or even your parents, I mean, let's face it, your parents are old. I don't even know if they could traverse those steps. We really need to be upstairs for our teaching and worship here at Alliance Youth. I mean, granted, it's a little rough right now. We've got wastewater pipes sticking out of the walls and we've got electrical hanging everywhere and broken and busted sheetrock and uneven subfloor and holes in the subfloor. And uh, we're, we're making progress on things right now, but we've got a long ways to go. Cool. Well, that's good. At least you have a plan because uh, me and my friends are really important. Yeah, you guys are pretty important. I agree. I mean, like, it's not like we are your, we are your future or like I am your future. Like, I, I am your future. I, I am your future. I am your future. We love Brecken, don't we? We love Brecken. But I was grateful that he came out. No school was actually missed in the filming of that video. I was grateful that he came out and helped me out uh, with that because it's meant to raise awareness for some of the cool things that God's been doing at Alliance Youth uh, here over the last several years. So just on Wednesday nights alone, the last several weeks that we had uh, at Alliance Youth this past spring with midweek were 42, 37, 35, and 32 students just with the 6th through 8th grade uh, junior high. In the downstairs area where we've been meeting for the last several years, we can fit a maximum of 22 students, uh, which is a really good problem to have. So what we've decided to do is to future-proof the youth house as well as to, well, I shouldn't say future-proof because God could like absolutely explode our numbers at some point in the future, but to help with the... Uh, uh, amenities that we have over there and fitting the students that we currently have engaged in youth group, we have started to move things upstairs. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, my wife shared a couple of those last week. Um, and, and one of the big ones is that we've had students in wheelchairs that have been unable to attend our youth programming over the last several years. Um, so accessibility and ADA accessibility is something that's been on my heart since 2019. And I brought it up at that time and then COVID hit and, and we started to kind of pray through some of these things and it kind of took a back seat. And then we had some more things happen with students with some pretty severe injuries that were unable to attend our programming and some issues with uh, getting some older folks with some medical conditions in and, and up and down those stairs safely and we've had some falls and things of that nature. Uh, so as we look to the future, we want to bring our programming upstairs and there's three kind of big things that we're looking to accomplish this summer. The first is we have torn out the kitchen. Uh, that's already done. The cabinets were sold and used to help fund uh, the kind of ongoing renovations that are happening over there. And we have torn out the center closet uh, in that area that is a load-bearing wall. So we have purchased a beam with some donation money that has come in to help with the renovations over there. I'll touch, that, touch on that in just a bit, uh, too. And we need to get that beam installed. Um, there's a couple of 22-foot uh, LVL beams that are coming in. We need to cut a hole in the south gable end and get those up into the attic and secure them and that's going to require some volunteers we don't have an exact date but we don't want to wait long so that's hopefully going to be happening sometime here in the next uh, several weeks so if you are at all interested in helping with that we will need people to assist with that particular portion of the project that's kind of step number one and if you have construction experience and you are like hey you know I know how to do something like that well I would love if you could help kind of quarterback that a little bit because I've never done anything like that before uh, and I would love to be a part of it and I would love to have our church family be a part of it but I honestly, as we engage in this portion, don't necessarily know what the next steps are for what we need to do. So if you were willing to help and come alongside of us in that way to assist, that would be great. Uh, the other piece that we're looking at doing um, prior to the fall is raising up the entryway. There's those steps that go up and either bringing in a ramp or some type of an electric wheelchair lift so that we can get people into the youth house safely. And in so doing, we will then eliminate the need to use those basement steps as part of our regular programming. We're also doing some things like moving some walls around in there, creating some bigger, more usable small group space because let's face it, particularly through COVID when you've got a small group of 18 to 20 sitting in like an eight by eight room, I mean, there's stacked three high. It's really hard to engage and take anything seriously when you've got two people sitting on your lap. Um, so we want small group space that works. We've moved our worship space upstairs. Our, our worship team has ballooned from about four students upwards to seven to nine students, which is awesome. God has been faithful on that front. And the, the, the space that we have upstairs gives us about an extra seven feet in width and about an extra five feet in depth that we can go so that we're not all standing there like this and trying not, you know, you've got to stand 
stand at this angle so your guitar doesn't, you know, hit the person who's swinging his drumsticks and things of that nature. Um, so there's some things that are coming on that front, and there's been a generous donor. I have no idea who they are, as I prefer those things to be, um, who has offered up $10,000 in a matching formation to help with the renovations of the youth house because they believe in the vision that's been presented to the elders and that's been presented to the management team. And they want to see this space be able to be welcoming and accessible to anyone who desires to go over there. Um, so the, kind of what my wife talked about last week is that before we do things, we have to have money in hand. And this donation is matching in nature. And so we have to have donations come in and then those donations will be matched up to a total of $10,000. Um, so if you feel it all led to give towards the youth house renovation, towards kind of the future of Alliance Youth as we springboard into the next decade, um, we'd love to partner with you on that. If you want to give towards that, you can put youth house renovation on the memo line of a check or indicate for some type of a a cash donation that that's what you'd like to do and as money comes in we will look to begin tackling these different projects there's an entire vision um, that that I have that I've shared with the elders and the management team for how that space will eventually look I don't know that we're going to get the entirety of that path walked prior to fall of 2022 but I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do in the coming years and honestly I have no problem meeting in an unfinished space eventually the goal would be to get that space finished um, to, to do things like remodel and make the bathroom into a unisex bathroom that's ADA accessible and things of that nature. The two big things for me right now, the two biggest things for me right now is let's safely get people into that space. So let's work on that entryway and let's make sure that we can meet because moving upstairs has given us a jump um, from about 22 to about 37 seats in its current configuration. And once we kind of have the whole plan done um, that will move into the mid-range of 40, close to 50, which gives us some room for expansion and growth uh, into the future. So. Uh, I'm excited. I would love to talk more about you or to you about that. I'd love to do it on site if you haven't been over to the youth house in years. Uh, it looks considerably different. We will still be utilizing the downstairs space as overflow small group area and as activity space. So that space has already been rearranged to springboard us into the fall. And uh, as we look though throughout the summer, the intent will be to be doing the majority of our work upstairs. So I'd love to chat with you about that. Um, I do have a couple of other announcements. To, to talk about as well. Our youth kickoff this summer is Wednesday, this Wednesday here at Alliance Church from 6 to 8 p.m. Students, wear things that can get wet because we are going to be engaging in some water type activities this Wednesday at 6 o'clock p.m. Also, Life Conference 2022 is coming up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we were, I got the, the reminder a couple days ago that we were inside the 20-day mark. Our pre-trip gathering is this Thursday from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. for Life 2022. So Life students, uh, don't forget about that. We're going to be gathering here at Alliance Church from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Thursday. And I've got one more thing I just want to get uh, and bring to your attention. So last summer at Providence, when our youth program went and we engaged in a mission trip through the Envision organization there, uh, we put on a gospel-centered soccer camp. We're doing it here in Little Falls starting this year. We've committed for the next three years to be engaging uh, in ministry that is put on, planned, and run by our Alliance Youth students here in Little Falls. Um, we have field space rented at Bell Prairie Sports Complex July 25th through the 28th from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., and we are going to be hosting an incoming third through incoming fifth grade gospel-centered soccer camp, and I would love if you could partner with us in prayer for that. Um, we're still, I'm still in the process of recruiting some students to assist with actually running the execution of that camp. God's been so faithful. He's brought some adults into the fold to fill roles that I didn't even know we needed to be filled yet before I had even started to pray about them, uh, which is super awesome. There's been pieces that have been moving into place um, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, oh man, it's been so good. Uh, it's been good to see the Lord's faithfulness. Um, it's, we've gotten some donations to get equipment to start up uh, that particular um, gospel-centered soccer camp because the equipment that we need to run a camp um, doesn't come cheap, and there's been some generous donations that have come in to assist with that as well. God is on the move. He's on the move. He's on the move in the hearts of our students. Um, we've got a lot of interest for our students assisting that week, um, but we need your prayer support. And I'm going to talk a little bit here as we prepare to dive into the message this morning about just how much your prayer means, because I want to talk a little bit about Big Sandy Camp. I've been there this past week as a camp pastor. 
So uh, we'll be kind of springboarding into the message here shortly, but I had to ask a question this week of the camp staff and the camp counselors and the full-time staff at Big Sandy, and it was this, why are we here on this earth? What's our mission? Why do we do what we do? Why do we come to church every Sunday? What is it that we do in our lives? What's the purpose of Big Sandy Camp? Why do we engage in our full-time jobs or our part-time jobs or our sports teams, whatever it is? As Christ followers, why do we do what we do? And I think it comes back to the core of Jesus desiring for us to reach every man, woman, and child with the gospel to bring light into the darkness. Jesus says the two greatest commands are to love God and to love people. How do we do that? He says, follow me. He says, create light. Follow me, create light. But in order to create light, we need to be moving out of the darkness. There's an incredible amount of darkness in this world. And one of the ways that we create light is by impacting those in our spheres of influence. This past week, I spent, I don't even know how long, counseling the counselors counseling the staff, offering support and encouragement from the word, uh, both to campers and to staff. I mean, it was like a 6 a.m. to midnight day every day with some crazy things that were happening uh, in the middle of the night on certain days as well. And the first day was three days long. I kid you not. It felt like it was three days long. And there was this dog pile effect of things that just felt completely overwhelming. And everybody at camp just felt a, this, this, this just overburdenness. I don't even know if that's a word, but I made it up, right? So th- there's just a weight that was present there. The day felt literally like it was three days long, and I emailed that prayer request. I think it was about like 10.30 at night that night because I was just sitting uh, in my cabin. I'd finally gotten a chance to breathe, and I just sat back, and I went, oh, God. Man, this is going to be a long week. <laughs> I was like, literally, I'm like, this is going to be a long week. I can't do this on my own. I can't, I can't do this on my own. I need you. And he's like, well, why don't you ask your church to pray for you? We had just gone through Colossians 3 a couple hours earlier, right? Like bear one another's burden. So I'm like, okay. Well, so I sent an email to Dawn and Dawn emailed that prayer request out. And I, I kid you not, I, I'm pretty sure the number has exceeded over 40 different responses to that, just indicating, hey, we're praying for you. Hey, uh, we've got this on our hearts. Hey, we're lifting you up today. Um, I mean, it was, it was overwhelming, the response. And that's not even counting the people who chose to pray and didn't respond in that way. And the rest of the week, all right, it got even more intense. I mean, God was clearly doing something. The enemy was rising up to oppose it, right? God was clearly doing something. The enemy was rising up to oppose it. But there was a spiritual energy that was present, a vitality that was present where it was like God himself was walking the camp and the physical manifestation of his presence was driving back the darkness. It was awesome. There was a peace that was almost physical in its intensity, and that lasted the rest of the week. And I'll tell you what, I'm exhausted today, all right? I'm tired And yet I feel, it's the weirdest feeling, I feel well rested and I feel energized. And I can't explain that as anything other than the presence of God carrying me through what was a very trying week. So I shared with the counselors, I shared with the staff at Big Sandy about the outpouring of prayer that our church was giving towards them over the course of the week. I shared that on Wednesday morning and I kid you not, one of the camp counselors, upon hearing that, she burst into tears. She just started bawling right there in the middle of, you know, 25 other camp counselors. And she, and she just, as she's sobbing, she's like, I feel it. I feel, there's a change from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday. I feel it. It's like God is here. And to know that it was God answering prayer in the midst of all of the trials and the tribulations was the best way to start that day. Let me tell you, it offered an encouragement that anything that I could say would fall woefully short of There were others within the church bearing the burdens of those who were on the front lines of ministry. It was great. It was beautiful. Here's another thing I want to bring to your attention and and pray about at Big Sandy Camp. It's on the heart of the leadership there to partner with prayer warriors for camps. To actually have people who would physically travel to Big Sandy Camp, maybe a group of three, four, five, or six people, and stay in the facilities there and spend time in unceasing prayer during the duration of the camps. I mean, I love 
what the Lord has placed on Doug's heart at Big Sandy Camp. Last year, they started bringing in camp pastors. That was my role this past week. Last year, they started bringing in camp pastors, and our sole purpose was to offer counseling, support, encouragement, accountability, and challenge to the staffer there so that those who are constantly pouring out could also be poured into as well. That was my role this past week. I wasn't the camp speaker. Okay, I was working behind the scenes, spending time in prayer, spending time supporting the counselors and the staff. Yes, I did meet with students, particularly uh, in the realm of things that were going on in counseling and apologetics and other things of that nature. But my primary purpose was to help them wrestle through how to lead and to lead well. Big Sandy desires to pour into the leaders who are leading to the people who are in front lines of ministry and they need prayer support to do that. I don't know how that's going to look in the future, but it's something to be praying over. Maybe that's something that moves your heart right now. Maybe you want to take a trip up to Big Sandy Camp and spend some time during one of the summer camps this week being present and praying unceasingly over the course of the week. All right, I've said it before. I love Big Sandy Camp. I love Big Sandy Camp. It's remarkable what happens at Big Sandy Camp. God is on the move. I said it earlier, where the kingdom advances, the enemy rises up to oppose it. I'll be honest, camp is struggling. Big Sandy Camp is struggling to get back to where they were with pre-COVID attendance numbers. They're at about 50% of where they were in 2019 still for the second straight year. That has major implication on operations because expenses don't drop. In fact, we've seen expenses rise and yet attendance remains low. And we can make all sorts of rational arguments about the economy and the state of things. And and here's where I've landed this week, because I've been praying about that and praying through that. Here's where I'm landed this week, right? God is on the move at Big Sandy Camp because there were six students who made major faith decisions at camp this week, two for the first time. God is changing hearts and changing lives at Big Sandy Camp. The best way for the enemy to prevent that is to have people not even go in the first place. Because when they get there, boy... It's hard to walk away from that space changed. It's special. God has done something in the midst of his creation there. You know, I was talking to the the camp director, Doug. Uh, He's the, well, I don't even actually know what his title is. He's the guy in charge, right? And and he said, Dr. Piffing, he had this vision. Could you imagine stepping onto a completely untamed patch of land where the poison oak and everything was up, you know, at shoulder height or higher, and and saying, and nothing's been cleared at that point, and saying God's going to use this as fertile soil for the advancement of his kingdom. Could you imagine that? That was 1959, right, that that happened, 1959. And there has been generations of hearts that have been changed at Big Sandy Camp. So be in prayer for them. It's a powerful faith ministry that we have here in central Minnesota. And if you haven't ever sent your child to camp, talk to me. Talk to Joetta. We'd love to get you the information there. It's been an amazing journey partnering with Big Sandy Camp these past few years and getting to experience what goes on there for an entire week in the summer. I mean, it was life-changing and transformational for me. Would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning as we prepare to to dive into God's word? Jesus, you are good. I pray for transformation. Today, I pray that we would not leave this place the same as when we entered it. I pray that we would recognize and surrender to your lordship wholly. And I pray that we, as a church, would continue to be on the front lines of ministry and our prayers for the things you are doing in this earth. Thank you for the faithfulness of hearts that choose to surrender all to you and follow you, bask in your presence, Lord. I pray that today would be a day and a service that glorifies you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So my message all week last week, I said it before, it was primarily given to the young men and women who were pouring themselves out for the sake of others, and it's centered around the same things that we talked about last week, right? This reality that we will reproduce who we are, that our spiritual example will be passed on to others. As Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, what is inside us will come out. Ministry is at its most faithful when it's based out of our own transformation. We've got to be plugged into Jesus. We've got to be fully surrendered to a gospel-centered life if we want our influence and our impact to glorify God and to lead others into deeper communion with him. We've got to be grounded in faithfulness. That's the heart behind everything that we're going to be talking about today. Because if we're grounded in faithfulness, what is inside us will come out and it will give glory to God by default. But we have to be grounded in faithfulness. 
We saw last week the impact of a failure of faithfulness in the lives of three great biblical heroes of the faith, Eli, Samuel, and David. We saw that each mentor that failed to deal with the things in their life that faithfulness to the Lord required, they ended up passing on to the next generation not only the good and powerful and effective things in their ministries, but also the bad and also the ugly. And there was this reproduction of generational sin that went from generation to generation to generation. And we talked about the reality of influence, and we talked about the reality of impact. So I want to spend some time unpacking that further this morning. Now, influence is the ability, either by personality, skill, or force, to persuade or affect someone in their thinking and behavior. And it can be good or bad, influence. It can be good or bad. And every single person on earth has influence. Every single person on earth leads. Are there any students here right now? Any, any students? Raise your hand if you're in Alliance Youth right now. A couple here? Okay. I say this all the time. Now, you're entering into sixth grade, so you might not know the answer to this. You guys have only been around for a few months, but you probably should know the answer to this. This is interaction time, okay? I say this all the time. All right, this is me testing you. What is the single most important thing you will do in any given day? Anyone, anyone got that? Okay. I say it all the time. All right? I say it all the time. Actually, Asher just said it. I heard it. Asher, he hears me say it all the time. The single most important thing we will do in any given day is spend one-on-one -on -one time with God. That is the single most important thing we can do in any given day because God desires and deserves the first and the best fruits of all of our time, our energy, our finances, our everything. Here's another question for you, all right? And this is where we're going to ground, be grounded in today, right? This idea of faithfulness. What is the single most important thing you will do in any given week? Lead yourself. Lead yourself. Why? Because our influence and our impact will never rise or be sustained above our self-leadership. And we are reproducing who we are. Ministry requires active self-leadership all of the time. All the time. And everyone who is here who has given their life to Christ does ministry. Why? Because we defined ministry biblically last week as any act of service that glorifies God. Any act of service that glorifies God is ministry. So we all have ministry on account of our lives existing for the glory of God. We're in it by default when we're in God's kingdom. Even if you never step foot outside of your house for the rest of your life, all right, you still have a ministry on account of your body existing as a temple of God Almighty because the Holy Spirit is indwelling the Christian. And by caring for your body and keeping it living, you are actually doing ministry because you are caring for that which God has entrusted to your care. You're caring for your very life. Self-leadership is ministry. You might never speak to another soul. I'm not advocating that you never step outside of your house again, right? Or that you never speak to another soul. I'm laying the groundwork here for some important truths we need to absorb this morning, all right? But you might never speak to another soul, and you are still doing and engaged in ministry. You are still leading. Every single person on earth leads. Now, you might not be doing ministry, and you might not be leading well if that's how you choose to invest the time that God has given you here on this earth. All right, it might, not be, it might not be well, all right? But as a Christ follower, we are always engaged in both practices, that of leadership, self-leadership or leadership of others, and ministry, any act of service that glorifies God. And there's no escaping this reality, all right? There's no escaping the fact that every single one of us, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we are a soldier on the front lines of ministry on account of our very belief in Christ as Lord. As surely as you are adopted into God's family as an heir to the promise, you are also drafted into God's army of Christ followers who exist, what? To reach every man, woman, and child on this earth for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are meant to bring light into the darkness. Jesus says, follow me, create light. Follow me, create light. We all lead. We all engage in ministry. There is no option B. There's not another plan. There's no opting out of this. That option does not exist in the Christian life. If you think you can dodge your divine calling to lead or engage in ministry, remember, ministry here is any act of service that glorifies God. If you think you can dodge that, after you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are being fooled by the enemy's subterfuge. 
by trying to avoid or abstain from leadership in ministry, whether it's through action or passivity, all we are really doing is a poor job at both. That's all we're really doing. But the fact remains is that we are still doing it. We are still engaged in it. And we need to own this truth this morning. There are no sidelines in the Christian life. We are on the field of play from the moment that we give our lives to Jesus Christ and surrender to his lordship. God has us in the game from the very first breaths of our life as a new believer. Now, how that plays out in the life of every individual will look differently. Okay? It will look differently. We're not all cookie-cutter copies of each other. Don't head in that direction with me this morning. All right? God says in his word that there is one body with many members. And diversity within the body as to how we lead and how we engage in ministry is and should be celebrated. All right? There's a wide array of the gifts and talents that God gives to people on this earth. And no two of us are the same. We are all unique. We're not robots. Okay? God's image, it's unchanging and it's holy. It's set apart. But we also have to remember that it is infinite in its depths. God is infinite. And how it looks through each and every one of us on this earth is a celebration of how our Heavenly Father looks as we continue to dive deeper and deeper into deeper communion with me and with, with him and with each other. But his mission, okay, the commands that he gives are for all of us. What does he say in the Great Commission? We're passionate about this here in the Alliance, right? He says, therefore, go. After you've accepted me, right? After you've loved God, you begin loving people. After you've followed me, you are meant to create light. He says, go. He says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is a command here for all Christians. And he says, teach them. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. Here's your assurance. I am with you always to the very end of the age. If God commands something of us, we ought to follow it. Not always easy in execution, but it's that simple in principle. And according to that command, our first steps as a new believer is baptism. Baptism is a ministry because it's an act that glorifies God. It's a testimony, your testimony, my testimony to the world that we are no longer a slave to sin and death, but now a member of God's family. If we've been transformed by Christ, we have been given a story to tell to others so that they can also be invited into a transforming relationship with him. From our first breaths as a new believer, we are in the game. It's right there in the Great Commission. We are in the game. Believe and be baptized. We are in the game. Now, here's how faith works from God's perspective. All right? Maybe, maybe no one's ever explained this from, to you, okay? But I want to I just give you a brief overview. And I realize that, like, we could get really theological with this and we could do things. But I want to give you kind of the 30,000-foot view of how faith works from God's perspective. Now, I turn away from my sin and I repent. That's my choice, right? I repent before the Lord. I do a 180 and I turn away from sin and I believe in so doing in the atoning work of Christ. I believe that what he did on the cross paid the penalty for my sin. All right? And in so doing and in so believing that, God actually redeems me from death. And I am justified. There's a theological term there. I am justified by Christ, meaning he cancels my sin. When I repent and I ask him to be Lord of my life, it's gone. He cancels the unpayable debt that I have. And therefore, I do a 180 degree turn from where I was headed, from who I was, to where I am now going, to who I will be in Christ, who I am in Christ, because now I am actually dead to sin. This is what happens when we give our life to Jesus. And then, on account of God's work, on account of what Christ did on the cross, on account of his desire for our restoration, he actually regenerates us from that death that we are dead to now to new life. So as a spiritually dead man, I am now given a new spiritual life, a new nature, Christ in me, 2 Corinthians 5.17, right? And I am actually sealed by God's Holy Spirit, which now indwells me, so God himself is living in me and working through me, and as a result, I can live a life that pleases God. And to symbolize this change, I get baptized, all right? And this marks a turning point in my life when I obey the commands of God, because my morality, my life choices, everything that I used to do now follows and aligns with God's word. 
And because of all of these things happening in me, God actually declares me righteous in his sight. He says that I am made good in his eyes. I am sanctified. All right, and we, and we call that this adoption, this, this heir to the promise type stuff that, that he says and talks about in Galatians as we've been journeying through there. Positionally, I am made 100% righteous in God's eyes, and yet I still sin because this is a sinful fallen world. I still engage and do things. I'm not 100% glorified and made into the perfect image of Christ yet because I still live in this broken and fallen world. So experientially and progressively, all right, because of Christ in me, because of the Holy Spirit in me, I am now given a new opportunity every single day to deny sin and take up Christ's cross and to live differently. And I get to choose to live differently. God gives me the free will to live differently than the day before because of Christ in me. And the cool thing is, is as we continue to surrender more and more to him, naturally, that is going to be where our heart goes and where our heart aligns itself to the glory of God. I am saved from sin to Christ. That's a picture of sanctification. And as a result, I am made into a disciple of the Most High. This is what happens in my new life. It doesn't stop there. Okay, my new life is charged with this mission. All right, this mission to be faithful to God before all else. That's at the core of everything that Jesus wants from us, is he wants and desires our faithfulness. And out of that faithfulness, I can joyfully lead, and I can joyfully serve others so that they too can see the transformation in my life and be drawn to a restorative relationship with Christ. And we can have this ever, cir- this ever you know, outgoing circle of discipleship where disciples are making disciples are making disciples and people are continuing to respond to the good news of the gospel. This is what happens when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. It's a truth we see in scripture. And we know that all scripture is God-breathed. Right? God's very clear about just how authoritative his word is meant to be in our lives. So we ought to pay attention to what it says. And let me tell you this, all right? If what I just described to you is not a start to a life of leadership and ministry, I don't know what else is. Because by our very nature, by our very nature, we are made into the image of Christ. Now, some of you are sitting here, right? And you're like, but Pastor Chris, hold on. Just hold on one second. Just... Just, just slow down, all right? I, I can't do that. I, 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 can't, I can't do that. I'm ill-equipped to lead, right? I can't do ministry. Are you kidding me? I, I need to be fed, right? I need to be fed, and I need to feel prepared before I can do any, any of that, that stuff that we consider to be ministry, right? All right, here's the deal. All right, I'm tired from camp this past week, so I'm not going to pull any punches. Okay, I'm going to do it in love, all right? But, but I'm not going to pull any punches. yes. You can lead. Yes, you you can actually do ministry. In fact, you already are doing both of those things on account of your influence and your impact reproducing who you are at this very moment. Like, we talked about that last week, right? We are always leading ourselves. Sometimes we're not doing it well. I understand that, right? But our spiritual example is always getting passed on to others. Whether we want to be or not, we are engaged in both leadership and ministry. There's no opting out. There's no plan B. But you're right. We do need to be fed. Okay? We we absolutely need to be fed because nothing that leadership or ministry accomplishes can be done on our own strength. It is all through Christ in me, the hope of glory. Right? I can't do it on my own. So we need to be fed. And that's where spiritual disciplines like love for the word of God comes into play. Right? The practice of the presence of prayer. Worship, connection, service, these core values that drive everything that we do here at Alliance Church, these are all what we call spiritual disciplines. Forgive my bluntness again here, but there's a truth that we need to hear this morning. And remember, ministry here is any act of service that glorifies God. Right? If, if we don't feel that we can lead, if we don't feel that we can do ministry, at its core, That is a confidence problem. And a confidence problem is really nothing more than a self-leadership problem. We have the Spirit of God indwelling us, and we have the best preparation course we could ever ask for available right at our fingertips. It's right there for the taking. It's right there for the exploring. 
If we're not living a life that is steeped in the power of God, it's likely because we are not plugged into the source in the first place. All right, so I use this example with with students from time to time. I used it at Big Sandy Camp this past week. I didn't actually even, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It kind of works. All, all examples are somewhat imperfect, right? Picture yourself as a vacuum cleaner right now. All right, picture yourself as a vacuum cleaner. Now, I can push around an unplugged vacuum all I want, right? It's still a vacuum. It still rolls. It's, it's filled more, more, more than likely. It's filled with all of the parts that it needs to be to be a vacuum, to accomplish the things that a vacuum does, but it doesn't fulfill its mission, all right? It sucks bad. That was a joke. It wasn't a good joke, but it was a joke. It sucks bad until, until it gets plugged into the source of its power. Then that switch flips. And once that switch flips, it no longer sucks bad. It sucks good, and it can fulfill its purpose. It can complete the mission that it was designed for. Each and every one of us was created on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God by the very way that we live, which means that our lives are grounded in faithfulness to our Heavenly Father. And whether we think we are or not, whether we want to be or not, we are already leading and doing ministry because we are both leading ourselves and directly impacting those within our sphere of influence. Now, during my ordination journey, this two-year-long journey, I was with a group of pastors, okay? And we received some blunt advice from a seasoned Christ follower who was engaging with us for some training. Here it is, almost word for word. I'm going to read it for you. This is what was said to me, and I think it needs to be passed on to every single one of us. You need to know that you are responsible for your own life. Now, I can offer you some insight. Maybe even some training and encouragement. But when you leave today, you need to own your life and the responsibility of the calling that comes with living that life in submission to Christ. A life of faithfulness. No one else can do it for you. That's your choice. And it begs a question. How? How do I lead a life of faithfulness? How do I lead myself well? And these are good questions to ask on a regular basis. And I'm not going to pull any punches here either, all right? Because I think our journey toward faithfulness starts with us becoming more and more like the dumbest of farm animals. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can open them up to John chapter 10 here. We're going to be in verses 1 through 5. And Jesus says this. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. In fact, they will run from him because they do not know his voice. Whenever John uses the phrase, I tell you the truth, it's like he's putting what he's about to say in bold text. Your translations might say something like truly, truly, or if you've got the King James, it might say verily, verily. It's a pay attention moment. Usually John is stressing something about Jesus and his mission, more, to, more often than not in regards to salvation, all right? But in this case, John is emphasizing here, really, kind of an all-encompassing truth of the entirety of Jesus' ministry here on this earth. And in so doing... Jesus provides us with the best form of self-leadership we can employ and pass on to others. Now, we're covering the first five verses in the Gospel of John here, right? But the rest of chapter 10 is just as good. And to be honest with you, chapters 10 through 14 are probably some of the most transformational in all of Scripture. So I encourage you to read those four chapters, all right? Consider that like homework for today. I can do that, right? I'm a youth pastor or associate or whatever they title me around here, right? Um, But here's the deal. I can sum up in one word for you, John 10 through 14. You ready for it? Followership. Followership is the capacity or willingness to follow a leader. We will always lead how we follow. Now, sheep, they follow really, really well. 
That's why we're compared to them all the time. But sheep are also prone to wandering, and they are incapable of saving themselves or living well without a shepherd. That's also why we're compared to them all of the time. Now, verse 1 paints us this picture of a sheep pen. And I love this picture of a sheep pen, right? Uh, A sheep pen normally would have been like rough stone or mud brick. And if it wasn't freestanding, it would have more than likely been buried in a hill. It may or may not have been partially uh, roofed. And the pen would serve as protection against thieves and wild animals. And the shepherd would actually lie down in front of the gate as a further deterrent above and beyond the safety of the walls against both thieves and wild animals. And it was the shepherd who would lawfully enter through that gate. And he would bring sheep in and he would take sheep out. And the sheep would know the shepherd by his voice. Oriental shepherds were actually known for naming their sheep. They would name their individual sheep so at any time they could call the whole flock or they could call for individual sheep and they would come and respond to their voice. Jesus calls his own by name. He knows them intimately. He has a special voice for them alone. He leads them out gently by the hand. He always goes before them. He brings them into rich and abundant pastures. He stands in the place of danger, defends them, his sheep. He gives his life for them. He holds them in his hand so that they can never perish. When we refer to Jesus as the good shepherd, we mean that he is the light of personal guidance step by step in our daily life. And Christ's guidance is so much more than just a target in the distance. It's actually his hand reached out, ready to be taken, so he can guide us step by step, a hand to lead us, And his voice is a voice that we cannot mistake if we're willing to be led. This is the light of which the psalmist sang. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs another bit and bridle to keep it under control. No, sheep, they listen to the voice of the master. And they do what he says because he has proven himself as their Lord. Do you know his voice? The voice of our master, the voice of Jesus? Are you willing to be led? Will you follow him even into the hard places of personal and corporate faithfulness? We need to ask ourselves these questions on a regular basis because we are going to reproduce who we are. Now, it wasn't uncommon for a sheep pen that we just saw to hold sometimes two or three or four different flocks And when sheep are penned together from multiple flocks, it's chaos. You can't tell them apart. It's like a sea of white. But every morning, as the shepherds would rise, they would each go to their respective corners, and they would use their peculiar call, and their sheep would respond to their voice, and they would come. And instead of driving them like cattle, the shepherd would lead them the way that Jesus leads us. Now, sheep, they may not be the brightest farm animal around, but they follow really, really well. We being compared to sheep should actually humble us. They know the voice of their shepherd. They followed him as a unit, and he led them to the most advantageous places of pasture and into protection from danger. And to their credit, the sheep would refuse to follow a voice that was not that of their master. In fact, they would flee from it. In a panic, they would flee and scatter from the danger of anyone or anything that was not their master. Our faithfulness, our faith, it is always connected to what we believe. And what we believe is going to impact to who and what we follow. Faith and belief always come before action. Sheep have faith in their shepherd. They believe he's the source of their protection and prosperity, so they listen to his voice and they follow his commands. They might not be the brightest farm animal out there, but maybe we need to take a lesson from their book. 
get just a little bit more humbled. Jesus is called the good shepherd. And the truth is we stray so easily unless we're following his voice. In Christ, we receive life more abundantly. If we're faithful to our heavenly father, there are still deeper and richer experiences in him that we can discover. In the Alliance for a Deeper Life and Missions Movement, deeper life comes before the missions. Faithfulness is what God values. When we find ourselves in the fold of Christ and in the intimacy of his discipline, that is when we truly live. It's when we obey him that he leads us in and out and through richer pastures. When we live within the disciplines of the word of God, we thrive. Our shepherd goes before us. He makes us know his voice even better, and he receives us into an intimacy with himself that is as close as his intimacy with the Father. My sheep listen to my voice, Jesus says. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. No one. So how can we be better sheep? How can we become better at faithfulness towards God? I think it starts with a question, something we need to ask ourselves every single week. Am I better, not perfect, okay, but am I better than last week? And maybe every month we need to ask ourselves another question. And let me give you some advice here. Ask this to your husband, your wife, your mentor, a significant other, people who speak truth into your lives. Ask them, hey, am I better this month than last month? If you want to get a good pulse on what you need to repent of, ask that question. You'll get some good feedback. I mean, ask my wife. She gives really, really good feedback. Right? I, I love her to death, but man, her feedback can sometimes be intense. But I use the word repent there intentionally, all right? Because repentance is at the heart of faithfulness. God has commanded all to repent. And repentance involves moral reformation, meaning the choices we make follow God's will now, which is given to us where? Through his word. And Christ calls each and every one of us to follow him. Follow me. Create light, he says. In the New Testament, the word follow is used to cover the idea of an established habit of obedience to the commandments of Christ. An established habit of obedience. Christ commands us to repent, to turn from ungodliness, not only for salvation, but also to enter into a deeper, richer, fuller life of surrender. You want to know how to be more faithful? Here's what it is. You start by doing the next thing that you know you should do to carry out the will of the Lord. Start with the next thing. If there's sin in your life, quit it instantly. Put away lying, put away gossip, put away dishonesty. Whatever your sin might be, all right? Deny yourself worldly pleasures and extravagant spending. Do what Jesus said we're to do in the Bible. Get right with any person you may have wronged. Forgive everyone who has wronged you. Begin to use your money to help the poor and advance the cross of Christ. Take the cross up daily. Live sacrificially. Pray. Attend church. Witness for Christ. Look to no cost and fear no consequence. Study God's word. Learn the will of our Heavenly Father and then do your best to apply it in your life as you understand it. And start now by doing the next thing. And then go on from there. Lead yourself well. Part of self-leadership is working the disciplines of restoration into our life. Obedience, yes, but also restoration so that our tank remains full. Because remember, our influence and our impact will never rise above our self-leadership. Okay, we reproduce who we are. And I don't know about you, but I want to reproduce healthy disciples here on this earth. And many of us, we mistake amusement for dis or distraction for restoration, all right? Someone came to me a number of years ago, and they said, ah, Pastor Chris, I just can't, I, I can't get right with God. Like, oh, he's just not present in my life. I, and then this person went on, and they explained all the different things that they're doing and all the busy things that they're doing and how they never have time for anything at all. And they're like, I can't, I can't feel his presence. I don't know what's going on. And I'm so frustrated that he's not in my life right now. I need him. He's not in my life. And then in the next breath, this person began to lament how they spent 12 hours on Saturday in their PJs binging Netflix. And then they had the question, why don't I feel filled up? Where is the presence of God? It's kind of like this right here, right? We wonder why we don't hear from the shepherd anymore. Well, maybe our focus and our intent is doing something that is not life-filling. We need to use our energy well. 
What I just described to you isn't restoration because the tank is still empty. What fills your tank? What fills my tank? What restores and recharges our spiritual batteries? What brings us more vitality in our lives? All right? When I'm done with something, what is the condition of my heart? Take prayer, for example. Right? Prayer should fill our tank, but oftentimes we finish praying and we actually feel like we're used up, like we're still empty, like our hearts are still unsettled. All right? And we need to ask ourselves in these moments, have I really fully released it to God? Am I still weighed down by something? Maybe, maybe something didn't go right. Maybe like Jacob, I need to go back at it again and I need to wrestle with God all night long. Maybe I need to develop more endurance. Maybe I need to develop more perseverance because I still haven't fully learned to release things to my Heavenly Father's control. When we read and study the Bible, do we do it because it's just an item to check off of our spiritual to-do list? Or do we truly and genuinely and joyfully enjoy the presence of our Heavenly Father? Are we in love with learning more about who he is? Maybe we do it because it's expected of us. All right? Let me tell you, though, if you're in a season of drought right now as you engage in Bible study in the Word, it can and will get better. You can experience the joy that God wants us to have in engaging with him through his Word. Pray about it. Ask God to ignite within you a desire and a longing for his presence to get to know him better. It might take a while, but it's still worth the journey and the pursuit. In fact, I'm convinced that God often deliberately takes extra time to answer things in our culture because we are so obsessed with instant gratification. We're so obsessed with it. And he wants to train us in the pursuit of perseverance for his presence to get to know him better. This happened in my life. It took over a decade for me after I first became a Christ follower to genuinely begin enjoying my one-on-one time with God. It took a long time for me to find that authentic joy that I heard other people talk about, all right? I, sometimes I had to feel like I had to manufacture the joy just to fit in with the rest of the Christ followers, like it was expected of me and I was doing something wrong. But when we talk about a decade, when we talk about the 11 years that I spent persevering in prayer finally to have that prayer answered, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what we get with our Heavenly Father in eternity. There's joy found in the pursuit. You want to know what finally did it for me? I teach, this, I teach this Bible study method at Alliance Youth called SOAP, Scripture Observation Application Prayer. It's not a silver bullet, but it's finally something that I found that, I, that worked. But even more so than that, even more so than that, I finally understood and surrendered my selfishness. For the first 11 years that I spent walking with the Lord, I'm not a morning person. I'm like the furthest thing from a morning person you can find. Okay? Someone told me when I first became a believer that as long as I was giving time to, to God, the time of day didn't, didn't matter at all. Right? And that's true. All right? That's true. Okay? Don't, don't think that I'm saying that, that what I'm about to tell you is like the only way to do something here. All right? But I was incredibly happy to hear that because I wasn't a morning person. It meant I could do my quiet time at night. It meant that I could do everything that I wanted to do in my life and spend all of the energy and the time that I had in my life in the way that I wanted. And then at the end of the day, I could engage in my quiet time with God and get refilled back up for the following day. I finally realized that it was selfish. I never had a full tank. My joy felt manufactured. And a lot of the time I felt like I had to make it up. Like I had to just keep on pushing through on my own strength. I stopped giving God the leftovers of my time and my energy. I stopped giving him the dregs of what were left over. And I began to give him the first and the best fruits of everything that I had, even before I rose in the morning. And I still do that. And you know what? I've got an energy and a fulfilled life now that I never thought that I could achieve. Okay? And it's not me that did anything, right? It's not me that did anything. I mean, if anything, okay, I did do something. I surrendered. I surrendered further to the Lord, and now I give him the first and the best fruits of my time and my energy in the morning. And you know what? I'm a mess. It's noticeable. If I don't get my one-on-one time with God in the morning, if I don't get it right away before anything else, I got no business doing ministry to anyone else because I am a complete train wreck without it. I'm irritable. I'm crabby. My tank is empty, and I don't have anything that I should be giving or passing on to others in my influence or my impact. I have to give God the first and the best fruits of my time and my energy and everything. Now, My time 
is a time of restoration with God. And here's the thing, it's probably going to look differently for you than it does for me. Okay, it's probably going to look differently because we're all created unique. We're part of one body, many members. But it's probably going to look differently. But we need to be self-aware enough that we can identify what it is in our life that fills our tank. Okay, taking a hike, riding a bike, listening to worship music. If you're stuck in a cubicle all day, the last thing you probably want to do is be solo, particularly if you're an extrovert. All right, and sit down with God's word and just spend time in his presence after you've had no social interaction for the rest of the day. It's okay to find restoration through brothers and sisters in Christ. Whatever it is, though, it should be time with your heavenly Father that recharges your spiritual batteries. God called me into discomfort so that I could grow, and I finally found comfort in his presence in the way that I had been longing for for so long. We need to be self-aware enough that we can identify what it is that fills our tank because The disciplines of restoration, they're critical to self-leadership. And God instituted rest into his creation schedule and into the life of the believer so that we can learn to commune with him better. Because if the petals of our lives are fully depressed all of the time, we are going to burn through our fuel in an instant. And this life is a marathon, not a sprint. So we need to slow down. We all have the same amount of time, but a finite amount of energy. So let's learn to spend it wisely in things that matter to God, things that we can carry on into eternity because God cares about our faithfulness far more than our effectiveness. And oftentimes we get those two confused. We forget sometimes that we are called to someone before we are called to something. Faithfulness to God looks like intimacy with God. That's why I say over and over that the single most important thing we can do in any given day is spend one-on-one time with the Lord because it is out of our faithfulness that transformation happens because Christ can work through us and use us to be the light that he desires to cast away the darkness here in this world. Again, not through my merits, but through his. I want to end with this. Each of us is called to lead ourselves well. Each of us is called to lead others well. We're meant to engage in ministry right in the context that God has placed us. And I don't know what that specific context is for you. But I know that it exists as surely as I know that your calling comes directly from Christ. So may Ryan and I, as your spiritual shepherds here at Alliance Church, never fail to lead you into deeper communion with Jesus. And may we, as sheep, who follow the good shepherd, the body of Christ, may we learn to recognize his voice and respond rightly to him with a heart of worship. True worship never seeks a return on investment and it's rooted in a right response to God. Let's pass on to the next generation our spiritual example, a spiritual example that is rooted in Christ, who is our hope of glory. Would you pray with me and then we'll worship together. Jesus. You say in your word, you say, you follow me. And I pray that that would be our response this morning, that we would seek to follow you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. We lift this time of worship up to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us, even though Jordan and I both forgot our straps and have to sit down.
It's all for your glory Till every soul is one Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 is my favorite verse in all of Scripture. But there's a couple of verses that come after that that I think are just as impactful. For God wanted them to know the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So, we tell others about Christ warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That is why I work so hard. That is why I struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Our self-leadership, our faithfulness, all of that is rooted in Christ's mighty power that works within me. It's in Christ alone our hope is found. Go with peace this week.